Hey guys, so I am in the studio today. Uh, excuse my nasaliness, my allergies are going crazy, but this is the only time that I have to record, so we're just going to roll with it. Um, so this is going to be a clips-based show. I'm going to play some clips that I've accumulated, and I'm going to give my commentary on them. So this first clip is going to be talking about goddess worship, and I mentioned it on the last podcast that I had a clip, and this woman explains it way better than I did, so let's listen. Why aren't we glorifying the suffering of women? Why is it only the one dude who mimicked? Love her, and she's talking about how we praise Jesus for the pain that he went through which every mother experiences through childbirth and then it's stolen and kind of given to praise of a man in our entire human history women have suffered and died in childbirth to create life and now we have a single male god who creates life hmm so something i'm obsessed with studying is how female goddesses became male gods in human history and this really happens at the time of agriculture so at first we're nomads we live with the land we're matriarchal and the goddesses are female and that makes sense because women were the kind of the heart of the tribe socially and they could create they could create life so god was female and especially god was kind of fertile female so you see kind of these statues with big breasts and hips and bellies because what is more magical than a woman's ability to create and sustain life then agriculture hits and when this happens farming becomes something men can do better because they have more muscles they have more male strength and so male strength is valued and then a priest class is born because for the first time we have a surplus and when we get a surplus we get a priest class and when we get a priest class we start doing hierarchies and when we start doing hierarchies we lose female goddesses attached to nature because now the priest class starts developing male gods and these male gods are strong they're hierarchical they have favorites they punish harshly, they demand things, they claim land as their own, something that female goddesses didn't do. And so even someone like Yahweh in the Bible was originally a storm god because weather becomes really important to an agricultural society, so you have to make sacrifices to the grumpy male powerful weather gods. So when a Christian comes on here and says, I'm going to hell, which I get every day, they don't know that God used to be female. And they don't know that female used to be the center of the community. And matriarchy was not flipped patriarchy. It was communal and it was regenerative. And we raised children together and women contributed 60% of the food through communal foraging. So they don't know that the creator God that they worship only came about because of agriculture. And the God that they worship is basically a storm deity. And their fears of this jealous God is because this is a male God, not a female God. And their wars and battles over which male God is the most dominant and gets the land is just superstition because God became male. And the very thing that they created their male God to be was out of vagina envy because it always had been women who were the creators in the community. And so why shouldn't we um, wear female anatomy necklaces instead of Jesus's cross because Jesus felt pain for a few days and then he's off in heaven we should wear necklaces of the female anatomy because if you want to talk about pain and sacrifice and creation we don't need your storm deity and we don't need your singular male creator God we have mothers who do that right before our eyes so that was no nonsense spirituality on TikTok and you know it's really interesting we're always hearing that um you know men were the hunters and women just sat around all day but in what species in nature is the female just completely like useless and unable to survive without, without the male it doesn't make any sense from an evolutionary standpoint why would the female of said species be unable to feed their young and themselves like it's not true in fact like you know lionesses they're the ones that do the hunting and uh, I think she said like 60% of the food was gathered. So that's, you know, more than half. Um, but yeah, fascinating. It makes a lot of sense from what I can see. It all checks out. I don't know if you have anything else to add, please do. But I just thought that was really interesting. All right. So this next clip is in response to this, this young lady. I forget her name. Um, she was basically coming, you know, she's a she was Catholic, raised with like 10 brothers and sisters or something. Obviously, her parents were financially well off to be able to do that. And like, clearly, this girl's had braces. You know, those are very expensive. Um, but she's sitting here, you know, childless, telling women that, you know, you just need to make sacrifices. You should stop putting your career first and just have children and blah, blah, blah. It's just she's this young lady's so out of touch with reality. <laughs> 
She's been brought up so sheltered and she doesn't quite understand like women have to work (laughs) to pay their bills and help with their family's bills. So this is someone responding to her ridiculous take that you just need to sacrifice and just, you know, not focus on paying your bills, apparently. Need child care if you're prioritizing your career and then that's just a priority and that's not really Emma's going off about the fact that millennials aren't having kids because it's not a priority for them and how child care isn't society's fault it's just because you want to prioritize your career like she says um but I think she's like failing to understand that the cost of living has skyrocketed while wages have stayed relatively the same and her only comparison is that she's one of 11 kids and grew up in Southern California her oldest sibling is 34 years old so that means her parents started having kids in the 80s um they bought a house most likely in the 80s and for perspective my parents also bought a house in the 80s in Southern California and their whole mortgage was the same amount as my down payment today for like the same type of property in the same area. She also thinks that universities are 100% a scam and that you shouldn't take on like thousands and thousands of dollars of debt when there's not a payout because a community college is just as good. And you know what? She's right. Yeah. Like if you want to go to community college, that's totally fair. But she's also negating the fact that the median home price in Orange County, California is $930,000. And in order to afford that, you'd have to be making upwards of $300,000. And I don't know really what kind of job you're going to get. It pays you $300,000 a year without having some form of uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. She also says that her mom never worked and it was just her dad. So you would have to be married to someone that makes $300,000 a year. (laughs) And I don't know what kind of person that's going to be like that high earner. But also like marry someone and have a child with them that doesn't have the same viewpoints financially. Because, like, the number one cause of divorce in this country is finances. And I'm pretty sure Emma is Catholic, and I think divorce is a sin. So I, again, really don't know where she's getting off. Also, I think the national average of child care is $65,000 a year. So she would have Jeez. to be earning more than $65,000 a year to justify having child care and not staying home. Um, which- Real quick, um, people like Emma, the young lady that this woman is responding to that are just so out of touch with reality, they say that child care shouldn't be... Um, something that the government has anything to do with. Basically, like, it's not the government's job to supply you with child care. You're the one who wanted a child. It's like, how quickly the tables turn from life is precious, uh, the government needs to intervene in women's wombs, to then, once the baby's born, I don't know, figure it out. Like, stop being such a welfare queen. It's just, yeah, the government does need to, you know be involved with child care. It's the future of our nation. Like there are some child care credits, you know, for low income families, but you know, you're taking your children to some sketchy daycares. I personally wouldn't ever really leave my child in like any daycare. I just don't trust other people. I'm not saying that they're all bad. Okay. Or you're like a bad parent. If you utilize them, it's just, I've worked in them and I've seen like the horrible treatment that these children get. Um, But, uh, yeah, the government does need to get involved. We can send billions and billions of dollars to other countries, but we can't even, like, give good child care for working parents or even maternity leave. Like, okay, I'll shut up. I guess she's doing. She's a paralegal, so I don't think she's making more than $65,000 a year. But again, that's depending on her spouse. Wait a second. So this Emma young lady who's telling us all to just, you know, stop choosing our careers has a career and no children. So she clearly had to go to college to become a paralegal, right? But you shouldn't go to college. Just the people telling you not to go should go. Okay. Uh, Making over $300,000 a year. And again, I don't know what jobs are paying that. I have three degrees and I don't get paid anywhere near Mm -hmm. that. So I don't know how you're going to earn that on one income today. Also, even if you had $300,000 a year in salary and you had an $8,000 a month mortgage payment, you still have to pay for insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't think she realizes how expensive insurance costs, specifically for dependents. My company pays 100% of my insurance, but if I were to have a child or any sort of dependents on my insurance plan, it'd be another $200 each a month. That's a lot of money. Plus, like, you also have to have a car, and if you're married, you have two cars, and cars are also expensive because, you, we know, like, we live in a car-centric area in Southern California, so that's probably at least $400 a month for two cars. That's, like, insurance and gas and whatever. Plus, you have to have phones. Plus, you have to, like, eat. Like, kids have to eat, like, three times a day. That's, like, I don't know, at least a $500 a month grocery bill. Me and my husband spend $500 a month on groceries, and mind you, like, we go to Sprouts and Whole Foods, but also, like, I would want the same for my child because eating healthy is a value of mine. 
So like even a $300,000 salary in Southern California isn't really getting you that far. And like when you reproduce, in my opinion, you should want to give your child the best life possible. And you want to open up doors for them that you didn't even have yourself. At least that's my value. So maybe she's right. It is a matter of values and prioritization. Additionally, this isn't even accounting for like going on vacations and doing nice things. It's so important to give your child enrichment in a variety of ways. So you're not even affording like annual family vacations or which all of this is so important for a child like they need to go out and experience culture i'm not saying they have to travel like far and wide but you know raising your child in isolation is not healthy for their development i you know they should be exposed to culture art um you know enrichment every child deserves that like christmas presents don't you want to give your kid like the best christmas that you can but maybe again, like that's just a matter of prioritization. And fine, if she doesn't want to own a house, if that's not a priority to her, then you're succumbing yourself to 8% rent increases every single year because in California, you can have an 8% max rent increase every single year. I mean, and even if you do have a house, the property taxes go up so exponentially over the years that eventually you end up having to sell your house. Like I've, I've seen that with so many people that I grew up with. My apartment five years ago would cost $1,500, and now today it's worth $2,000 because the landlord wants to capitalize on his investment. When you rent, you are helping someone else's investment portfolio grow. I just, like, wish people wouldn't stop regurgitating their boomer mentality, like, from their parents. Like, obviously, I know that she doesn't really have a lot of her own independent thought, and this is just, like, her Catholic, obviously, they're Catholic, there's, like, 11 of them, perspectives and viewpoints, and I'm like... This is crazy. And like, let's say even if you were like, I can't afford to live in Southern California, you should just move to out of state. Then you're like, again, like sacrificing your child's relationship with their grandparents or with like having cousins and aunts and uncles and whatever. And like, again, like I, that's so like fucked up. And I just mm -hmm. don't understand why you would want to live in a society that doesn't help the middle class, like get the best of their life that they can. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, that's pretty much it for that clip. Um, but yeah, again, it's quality over quantity. Everyone's like, have babies, have babies. What kind of quality of life are those children going to have? You know, I would prefer to have one child and give him the best of the best that I possibly can. Um, then have like five children that, you know, I can't even pay to send them to like summer camp or do something fun. So, okay. So this next clip is about women's intuition. Women almost always 100% know when they're being cheated on, even without a confession. It's because women have a stronger sense of frequency of authentication. This doctor was saying how women, like the women's intuition, men have it also, but women are more in tune with it because we're more in tune with our emotions. And women can literally sense if they're being, like, deceived, if they're being lied to, if they're being deceived. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with body language also, but women, we also study our man more, like, we study them in different situations, probably also with women are more detail oriented and we're more, we pay more attention to details. This is science. So we know our partner's pattern, especially the more you're with them and you've, you know, you've seen their answers in different situations, what they get nervous with. It's also body language, but it's also what you're giving me is not the truth. What you're giving me is not, it's not real. Like you're lying, like you're making stuff up, whatever. Women have a stronger sense of frequency. So that's how most likely when women say that their partner cheated, they could literally feel that they cheated on them. Like it's something that just like, it's straight in the gut. I think it also has to do with our survival. Like we have to pay attention to little tiny little details because it can mean the difference between life and death. So yes, not only are women more in touch with their emotions, but I think we also have a higher survival uh, instinct. And um, I believe even women have like a large degree more of peripheral vision than men do. And that really makes sense from a survival standpoint. Okay, so this is following up on a clip that I played a couple podcasts ago about, um, you know, chivalry and romance being started by the chivalric knights as an, like a mating strategy to get access to women when they didn't have a lot of resources. They would use, you know, romance and poetry and all of that to woo these women. Um, and I did get a comment from somebody. They left it on my music channel, though, that like, this is wrong, you know, love is blah, blah, blah. There's a difference between love and romance, though. Like, I'm not saying that men um, don't love. I mean, 
princella has got a pretty interesting theory about that. I don't know. Um, but I won't get into that now. Um, but basically, it's that romance is a strategy because they can turn it on and turn it off. Like, it's almost a manipulation tactic, really. Um, and then it's also, you know, used as a mate guarding tactic as well. Like, it should be at least, you know, men should continue to court and date their woman that they're in a relationship with. So she stays happy, you know, like it shouldn't just stop once the woman is secured in his eyes. But that's that's what happens. That's like a universal experience. So, OK, but this person, um, Cecilia Regina, 275 on TikTok, she is um, and I'm sorry, I sometimes forget to name the creator of these clips that I'm playing. So I, I apologize in advance. I'm going to get better with that. Um so this is her take on it, that romance is actually a rich man's game. And I kind of I'm seeing like both sides. I think romance is just like a tactic that men use of many different persuasions, whether they be lower on the status or higher on the status. Um, it's used as a tactic, a mate guarding tactic and a mate acquisition tactic. But this was very interesting because it kind of debunks what I was putting forth um, in the last clips podcast. So let's listen to Cecilia. Invented romance in an attempt to compete with the rich and powerful men of their time for access to the best women. And this is because if a guy couldn't convince a woman that he had something special, something intangible that the king didn't have, there's no way he's getting laid. Y'all keep passing that video around, and it sounds good in theory, but it lacks a lot of context. The reality is love, romance, all that have always been a rich man's game. The very first poem ever written was about love. It's called The Love Song of Shu Shen. They found it when they were excavating the Mesopotamian region, uh, looking for evidence to corroborate the Old Testament. And even if you want to look at the Old Testament, hello, Song of Solomon or Song of Psalm songs and they're very similar i mean if you look at the shu shin poem bridegroom dear to my heart goodly is your beauty honey sweet lion dear to my heart goodly is your beauty honey sweet you've captivated me let me stand trembling before you all that sort of thing what are these poems about uh the love poem of shu shin is about a king marrying a goddess symbolically so you know the worship of a feminine entity and the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs is about a king marrying a woman, but he's romancing her first. He's praising her beauty. In addition to offering to put, you know, his fortune at her command, he's telling her how beautiful, special, intimate they are together. And if you want to go back to what this guy is saying, of course, there was a tradition of chivalry that was invented by the knights around the 15th century, but that quickly morphed into courtly love. That means it was being practiced by noblemen and the king himself, you know, King Henry Tudor used courtly love to get Anne Boleyn and all of his other wives, but that's neither here nor there. Kings, princes, noblemen were writing poems to the women in their lives, whether they commissioned poets like uh, King Henry Tudor commissioned Thomas Wyatt or later nobles commissioned Shakespeare, all those love sonnets, most of them were written pursuant to a commission. That means he was paid to write them. So love or romance has always been fueled by money. Here's just one such example. So if you were poor like Shakespeare, you were going to have a patron. But writing and wordplay is mostly the playground of the upper class. That's why when you think of love poetry, you're going to think of men like Lord Byron. Lord Byron, he's an English peer, and he spent his time writing some of the most famous love poetry the world has ever known. Romance is a rich man's game, always has been. So either you're going to participate by doing it yourself, using your education to show off for the ladies, or you're going to use your funds to commission and buy romance from the more talented but poorer players like Shakespeare. Or John Dunn. I think the OP was well intentioned. And what he's saying is true. You should not allow poor men to use an ephemeral feeling to get next to you. But the fact is, romance and love have always been a rich man's playground and they always will be. So don't Whoops. allow yourself to be bought for the cost of words. Like, yeah, um, I really like that last part. Don't let yourself be bought 
for the cost of words. I think I butchered it, but just rewind it if you want to hear her say that. That makes so much sense because it's one thing to be presented a poem as like the cherry on top of a very generous man that has financial access and has resources. Then it's less valuable to be given a poem by like a guy that works at GameStop who can't like who can't provide you a good life, you know? So it's like, it's all about who's using the tool and who has more to give and who has more to gain. So I just thought that was very interesting. All right, this next clip is from Mel Hamlet, and this is on male loneliness. ...of single men now saying they don't have any close friends, and more than half of all men report feeling unsatisfied with the size of their friend groups. I recently traveled to Phoenix to take a closer look at the implications of male loneliness and how some men are confronting it. Seven men showed up for that first event. Are you guys warm? Which Winston says only happened because of his wife. You encouraged him to form this group. Yeah, I wanted him to have a social life. (laughs) She's like, yeah, I needed him to get the hell away from me and make some friends. (laughs) I needed him to not put all of his stuff on me and get some friends it's just it's so sad that like men just they don't even know how to be friends for each other or make friends and their wives are having to be like mommies organizing play dates for them (laughs) like okay outside of just us doing things together all the time which (laughs) was great but i still felt like he needed to have guy time and guy friends yes yeah she made it evident that i need to go make some friends <laughs> go disappear for go a disappear. bit now you got some friends. <laughs> yes you know come back but you know go go <laughs> such a hard time forming friendships and keeping them as they progress through life you can't neglect a friendship and expect it to just grow you have Bingo. to work at it you find the time and my observation is that many women are just better at doing that and building it into their lives. And while men make up slightly less than 50% of the U.S. population, they now account for nearly 80% of all suicides. Ah, 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 ah. I'm going to stop them right there. I have so much to say about that video, obviously. This is my wheelhouse, and anybody who doesn't already know, I wrote this article for Harper's Bazaar. went super viral. Saturday Night Live, uh, in this, this article... They give me credit for the skit Saturday Night Live did about it. It's been in four different books, podcasts. This conversation about male friendships has been going on for a long time. My research and reporting brought a different angle in terms of how it affects women. I care about men, but I also care about women and men not dealing with their crap and not making friends and not knowing how to have friendships, which is what a marriage should be. Mm Mm-hmm. By the way, so men who are terrible at friendships are also usually terrible partners, too. Mm -hmm. Not always. It's a little different. But as that video was talking about, men do not, uh, they're not taught in, in patriarchy how to make friends and sustainable friendships because a lot of them don't want to put in the effort and the time that it requires. That's what it comes down to. Um... Like she said, if they're not good at maintaining friendships, they're not going to be good at romantic relationships because relationships are like plants that need to be watered, fertilized, like sang to, pruned. You know, it's not just like you reach out whenever you need something. That's what a lot of narcissists will do. They're just like only when they need something, they'll only talk about themselves. They never ask you questions about your life or anything like that. Um, And I think it's a lot of it because we're socialized as women and girls to do that. Relationships are a fundamental part of our lives and they also increase our chance of survival. So again, I think a lot of this comes from a survival instinct. Requires to build community, build friendships. And as one of my mutuals talks about a lot, I mean, most of my mutuals talk about this, but it's the first time I ever heard it was uh, that men lay the the social fabric. Right? Men are not taught to do that in general. And then a lot of them just don't care enough to figure it out. And women have had to do that. Uh, None of this would work without us. Right? Without us doing all the emotional labor, uh, birthing, you know, without, without babies being born. And especially women enabling men and taking care of everything for them. Like, everything would shut down. Right? So, uh, God, I have so many thoughts on this. Uh, But before I get to anything else, I want to call attention to this. Women are more likely 
to attempt suicide than men. While men um, die by it four times the rate of women, women are, you know, th the stats are different, but uh, three to four times more likely to attempt it or, you know, to talk about seriously considering it. Now, part of that is because men don't talk about things and then they end up not getting help and then they end up doing it. Um, but I talk about this because I also care about men's impact on us when they refuse to take care of their mental health. And a lot of their mental health is literally rooted in them refusing to question patriarchy, to refusing to give up power. So they're stuck in this little prison of their own making and then they hate us for it. I also want to call attention to this. Women who suffer domestic violence are three times as likely to attempt, right? I highly encourage y'all to go read this. It was very good reporting. Maybe I'll make a whole video on that later on. But the financial abuse, especially that women uh, endure from these men, the emotional abuse, all that stuff, if they get out alive, a lot of times, especially if they're financially abused with this is so, 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 so common, these men will ruin our lives. And then we don't know how to get out of it. And a lot of women are hopeless. They can't afford therapy. They can't afford anything because these men have taken everything from them. And they're traumatized. We'll never trust anyone again. Right? So whenever they bring up that statistic about men and their suicide, y'all don't care about ours. Y'all don't care about ours. God, if we're going to talk about the, the male loneliness crisis... What about women's loneliness? Do you know how lonely it is to be trapped in a marriage or a relationship where a man has cut you off from all your friends or that man is so exhausting? All you do is take care of his life, the children that he put inside of you, his finances. His, like, like Men are so exhausting that women who are married to men, who are unhealthy men, abusive men, you know, narcissistic men are just men who refuse to work on themselves. These men are so exhausting. They literally take our lives, but there's no statistics on that. All these autoimmune diseases and stuff. Women stop taking care of themselves. How is that not slow schmooicide on some level? Just tapping out, giving up. How is that not homicide, passive homicide? At the very least, these women are so, so, so lonely, but they're... You know, maybe all they have is their friends if the men haven't cut us off from them. And you know why a lot of these men are lonely? It's because they don't make any effort. They don't put time and energy. They don't call their friends. They don't do any of that stuff. And they rely, their entire social life is, depends on her. And then they treat her like crap too. And then when they do have friends, all their friends are like at work. And they go do pointless stuff. And I'm not saying hobbies and sports are pointless. But what I am saying is that a lot of these, and that's what I wrote about in my article, a lot of the things that men do with other men involve no intimacy whatsoever. Involve no real talk. No calling each other on their crap. No real growth and development and relationship building so that when these men really need someone, those are not the people they are going to call. They go hunting together. Or they play games. Or they go climb. But they're not talking about anything. And then those men that are struggling emotionally will seek out a woman to either trauma dump on her, use her body as a regulation tool. They'll push for sex because, you know, they don't know how to regulate their emotions and they don't even care to learn. So they use women's bodies as regulators. Um, they'll go to women for validation instead of, you know, digging deep and, and finding out why they have these feelings. Um, and that's why as women, we really need to set strong boundaries with men because I've noticed it. Men that aren't approaching me romantically, they're just like, Hey, I love your music, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I respond back I'm cordial. And then before you know it, they're sending you millions of messages a day and basically having a conversation with themselves in your DMS because you're not even responding and it's like buddy go find a friend <laughs> I'm not really interested in male friendships like really so I don't know go find somebody that wants to talk to you I guess real half the time I'm sorry but watching a football game and drinking beer with a dude if you're not talking about anything else just that you are definitely not going to cry in front of that man 
you know who they do cry in front of? Us. Yep. But half the time they're weaponizing their tears. They're crying and they even threaten schmooicide to keep us from leaving them. And most of the time those men are not serious. And if a man is threatening that, I've said this in many videos before, if a man is threatening that to get you to stay, which is what they do, this is so common in abusive relationships, that is an abusive relationship. That's abuse to threaten that. Or they'll use the children as pawns. That is very common. All the mental health professionals. Let, let them deal with it. I am here for men healing. I even wrote a whole article full of resources, books, podcasts. I interviewed men who started men's groups. And I don't mean men's groups that are like in schmelly where all they do is complain about their wives. I mean men's groups that are about real intimacy and men building community and connection and holding each other accountable and crying in front of each other and the ones that make these men healthier, not most groups of men, which are just men reinforcing the same crap. Yeah, like I saw Mel had done a video about Liver King's like boys or men's camp or something. These men are paying like $1,800 for a weekend to be verbally assaulted and like put through a boot camp. Like, guys, that's not how you deal with male emotions and depression and suicide. You don't like put them through more trauma. But that's what men think they have to do to become stronger. Just go lift weights and just ignore all my problems and lift weights and ignore my sadness until it eats a hole in my heart. But then I'll just go lift more weights and everything's going to be great. Right? Like, I am not here for those kinds of groups. And I even interviewed someone for that article whose dad had gone to a men's group and it made him more toxic yeah. and just like a worse person. It's I trauma. Think that, that got cut out of the article just for word count. But the other very telling thing about that, like, go, I'm linking the, um, I'm linking that video here uh, in the, con in the caption. But I, like, I actually love the, the, the couple that they interviewed in that. And I really love what that guy you know, this is what I want men to do. Preferably, you know, with the help of books like this. I know it's an old book. It's outdated. There's probably an even better one. But this is the book my husband used. He started two different men's groups. And the book she's referencing is called The Men's Group Manual. And I really like men need to start doing this. A lot of them are sitting around waiting for women to do it because it's emotional labor. And I think a lot of men are just so used to us coming along and like doing everything like, oh, you don't feel good. Let me let me change the environment, you know, to make sure that you're OK. They're just so used to that. Um, so they don't think that they actually have to like be leaders. That's what being a leader is as a man, starting a men's group, getting together and encouraging each other through hard times and supporting each other emotionally, being able to cry and not have a bunch of men call you a loser. Their groups are phenomenal. The work they're doing in those groups is mind blowing because they actually have something to help guide them on how to build trust, how to have healthy communication, how to call each other out, but in a very loving, kind way, how to hold space. Like, th I'm sure there's other ones. I don't know this person who wrote this. I don't get anything from telling you all this. It's just a resource. But, you know, the uh, a meetup group, I love that he was vulnerable like that. Go watch that interview. He just was like, yeah, it was scary. I didn't know if anyone would show up, but it was a start. It is about taking action, putting yourself out there. Stop being so cowardly in, in your relationship because that's when you lose the uh let me know if you want a part two i got more to so yeah i just thought that was very interesting and i hope that more men start doing stuff like that and the ones that do i see are encouraged to do so by their wives i don't think they would have done it without their wives support and encouragement um, so remember, we, we are very important, um, in the health of men's relationships, but it is not, it is not our job to go out there and do the legwork for them. We can show them the path like, Hey, you might want to go down this way with your fellow bros and like help each other. Um, but I'm not gonna like carry you down the path. <laughs>
you got to go, you got to lead. Um, so it's encouraging to see more men doing this. And I hope that this trend uh, becomes more popular. And I think everyone would be so much happier because I just know like growing up, my mom was like the social one. My dad really wasn't. So like his only social stuff came from my mom and all her friends, you know? So it's just, it's, it's all too common. It's very sad. Um, and I think it's really important that we teach our boys, especially because they get a lot of information from our culture and society to not care about relationships and emotions and putting those things at the forefront of their lives. But we need to encourage them to, to foster and nurture relationships because if you don't they don't sustain they don't grow that's just that's like anything if i don't water my plants in the dead of summer they're gonna die a slow painful death so with relationships we have to nurture those and i know it's hard in this digital age and we're all so busy and everything but you know, it's just it's just the little things. It's following up with messages, you know, or letting them know, hey, I'm busy. I'm probably not going to be able to talk during this time. You know, no offense. It's just it's just those little things that we do every single day to nurture relationships that are so important. And I don't think they're taught um, very much. OK, so this next clip is about Mary worship. This is a friendly comment, so this isn't a snapback. But whenever I talk about when God was a woman or the erasure of female deities and female archetypes in the Abrahamic patriarchal religions, someone inevitably says, but what about Mary? But if you, as a religion, destroy the shrines of Asherah, the female consort to Yahweh, and you condemn female spirituality as fertility cults and heretical and primitive, and you stop worshiping Mother Nature in favor of this strong, singular, weather, battle, male god, um, who by himself is the creator of life, which is already, like, so confusing. And then not only that, the god that's replacing the feminine divine, he's also angry, and he throws tantrums, and he sends floods and to people who aren't obeying him. And he sends bears to kill children. This is a father god who is powerful and scary and totalitarian and jealous and capricious. Then subconsciously what emerges is the veneration of Mary because we missed mom. So if for 2,000 years we worship the feminine divine as part of our kind of relationship with nature and our communal nature, and we trade that for this absent, threatening, angry, jealous father, then we're going to need a mommy. So for me, the worship of Mary is not the same thing as the feminine divine because Mary is something that women can't be, which is to be a mother and be a virgin. She's not what feminine archetypes and goddesses used to be, which is a love of pleasure and being in your body and healing and language and art and music and hearth and wisdom, which is what we see from our early female goddesses. She's not there because she's wise. She's there because we needed a mommy and for no doctrinal reason at all, we started worshiping her and asking her to intercede on our behalf because we were scared of daddy. There is more to the feminine divine when we look back at our archetypal stories than the ability, than just your womb and your virginity. That was from No Nonsense Spirituality again, a really interesting creator. Um, I personally remember being very drawn to um, Mary, like at my Catholic church. I remember I would leave the service and go to the little Mary thing, like statue where you could light a candle and just like pray to her or whatever. <laughs> I felt more comforted around that. And by the way, most depictions of Mary are clearly a representation of a vulva. It's, it's like very obvious. Okay, this next clip is from YV underscore edit about um, how marriage protects women. I personally used to think that marriage was like a trap. You shouldn't get the government involved in your relationship, but I was very young and naive. But now I see that while not perfect, the legal contract of marriage is supposed to protect you. Um, so let's listen to her explain this. We need to stop romanticizing marriage. Marriage is a legally binding contract between two people. It is not some like romantic foo-foo thing. That's how it was invented to be. That's for a reason. Don't ever let anybody talk you into a spiritual marriage or we just didn't want to sign papers. We just didn't want to get the government involved. You should get the government involved. 
Stop romanticizing it so much that you forget what marriage is really about. Marriage is about protection, especially for women, especially for women who plan to be mothers. Marriage is a thing that protects years of investment that you have probably put into your relationship. Like you wouldn't, if you were trying to save money, would you just put it out on your coffee table and like just keep stacking it? No, you would like put it somewhere where it's protected. You would put it in a safe. You would, you would make sure to protect it because it's an investment, because it's something that you are basing your future on, right? The stack of money that you are adding to is something that you are assuming is gonna be there when you go to look for it next time. You'll only regret not putting some kind of safeguard on your money or on the things that are valuable to you when you get home and all of a sudden that money's not there anymore. And then you're gonna be like, wow, I should have protected my money. I should have put it somewhere safe. I should have not been so nonchalant with it. And that's basically what happens to a lot of women who experience cheating in their relationship, who know a man like using them to build his empire and like convincing, you know, this woman to build with him and then we'll get married and all that. And then you invest the best of your life, the best years of your life into that. You invest your energy, your time, your money into this man and into his business and into all the things that he wants. And then what does he do? he upgrades his woman he doesn't want to be with the woman that he built with he wants to be with the woman that he's going to get when he's at the top and that's why you never be a barb the builder ever don't do it don't do it because just like she's saying once they once they reach that that next level of status they're going to want to find a woman that's on their level and you the woman that helped him when he was down and out you're a reminder to him of how pathetic he used to be so he does not like that Uh, but it's just crazy to me like how people can be more open to having a child together than they are getting married. Like I used to think that way. And I just look back and I'm like, what the hell was wrong with me? <laughs> like, what? Oh, it's just a piece of paper. No, no, no. It's a legal contract that should be protecting both parties and their assets. But like this is this is becoming more and more common. Um, and I understand because people are like, I don't want to go through the divorce process and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, th- those legal contracts protect you. And he wants to just chuck you aside. And I just don't think you should be able to do that without legal consequences, or at least without having to amicably, you know, split and like make sure that everybody gets everything fairly. Because not all of us have Mariah Carey money and we can't just go after men for wasting our time intentionally. But there is precedent for that. Just so you know, she did win that case. So there is precedent. If you do have money, you can try it. But yeah, do not romanticize marriage so much that you forget what it's really about, which is asset protection, which is your time protection. It's also a really great way to weed out men that were never going to marry you anyway. You know what I mean, like if marriage is what you're after, uh, I'm not saying that marriage is something you have to want. But if it is, if you do want to share your life with someone, if you do want to build any kind of life with someone, just know that the only person worth doing that with will marry you in a heartbeat. If a year or two has gone by and there's no ring and there's no plan to get married and there's no extenuating circumstances that are forcing it to be that way, like, for example, you know, I have friends personally that um, were in college or in high school when they started dating and it was absolutely not practical for them to get married until they were done with college, and then, which is exactly what they did. Like, he proposed to her that summer when they finished college. Because why wouldn't you? You're starting a life together. You are starting to officially combine your assets. You're starting to officially build together. It's like getting a business license to operate a mm-hmm. business. It's like saying from this point on, we are both investing into this relationship. And here is like a protection for that. Here is like a liability cover for that. Because it also grants you really, really important rights that if you are with someone for more than like two to four to six years, like who should not be without those rights? You have to be married to be on somebody's health insurance. If an emergency happens, it's either going to be your spouse or your parent. That- And especially if you're going to be a stay-at-home mom, especially it's going to protect you, right? Because it's going to ensure that he can't just, like, take everything away from you and you be destitute and have nowhere to go. At least it should, Um, like prenuptials and things like that, that will protect you from being so vulnerable. I'm not saying that no women should ever be stay-at-home moms. No, but you got to be smart about it, right? You got to make sure you've got like backup plans and you've got your own finances and, um, you know, that you're protected in your marriage contract from, you know, having the rug pulled out from underneath you and having nothing, especially if you're going to invest years of your life, like not out on the career path, you know, that's a huge sacrifice. And being a stay-at-home mom is a hard job or just being a stay-at-home parent. It is a hard freaking job. And I'm sick of all these trad people acting like it's so easy. It's so fun. What an insult, honestly. Like I've never been a 100% stay-at-home mom, but like for the first couple of years of my son's life, I really was because I was in grad school and I was only working part-time. Um, And like, you don't get a break, you know, so it's an I would be insulted as a stay at home mom if someone said, oh, your job is so easy. If it's so easy, then why don't men want to do it? (laughs) If it's so easy, why, why is no one being like paid for it?
makes important decisions and like who would you rather it be at that point like who is it that you live with and spend most of your time with would you want it to be that person or would you want it to be your parents and you have to be married you can't just like cover just anybody on your health insurance so no marriage is not all about love it's a very practical and very necessary thing if you are going to invest years and years and years of your life into being with somebody okay so don't let anybody romanticize the idea of like marriage or like de-romanticize the idea of it so much that it's like oh it's just signing a paper it's not it's important rights it's important protections it's health it's uh, it could be a matter of like life and death if you you know lose your job and you lose health insurance like it's protection for both of you it's a proper reward for the fact that you have invested years and years and years of your life into building a life with this other human being As i see it as like a business venture like a business acquisition where you're like okay we're merging <laughs> we're merging together we're combining our assets and i feel like i feel like married couples should have like mission statements <laughs> it is our mission to bring three children into the world and build a deck. No, I mean, it would be like better than that. But um, I'll let her finish. Um, very wise woman. Again, a happily married woman. Slavic. I'm telling you, these Slavic women know what's up. Especially if you're contributing to their standard of living, especially if you're paying bills half and half, like, especially if you're, you know, helping to fund things, you're helping them get through school, etc, etc. Like, you need to have like a legally binding document. It's very important. Marriage is not spiritual. It's not a ceremony of love and commitment. It's a legally binding protection for you. Something that my grandmother, my um, Irish grandmother, who raised 11 children with no running water or no electricity, she always said this quote. And when I was younger and more idealistic, I was like, ah, what does she know? Love conquers all. But she was like, um, oh, what was it again? When love walks in. No. OK. When poverty walks in the door, love flies out the window. And I was like, damn, she's right. <laughs> love is not enough. OK, love is a great thing. But again, love is an action, in my opinion. You know, yes, you can have the feeling of love, but it's like loving somebody is an action. It's not just, oh, I feel this way. Therefore, my partner feels loved. No, you have to like show them through actions that they are loved, you know, creating a sense of emotional and physical safety, um, you know, being a shoulder to lean on, being a support in their life. But my grandma was right. OK, it doesn't matter how much you guys love each other. If you can't pay the bills, that love is not going to pay your bills and it's not going to pay the bills for your children either. All right, this next clip is from a creator named Zach, and it is about women's sex drives, <laughs> which I personally like to d describe it as like desire instead of a sex drive. I'll get into that on another podcast, but uh, let's listen to what Zach has to say. You're in relationships with women who don't want to do the deed anymore, huh? Couldn't be me. I know the tale like the back of my hand. You're six months into the relationship. You're saying, oh, she doesn't want to do it anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I should go to the gym. Maybe I need to get a haircut. Something. No, you're going the complete opposite way you're supposed to be going, brother. Snaggletooth McGee over there is getting it on the daily, and it's because he did what he was supposed to do. Because Snaggletooth McGee knows that women's sex drives are right here. They entirely have to do the with what they feel and what they think about you. So you can look all kinds of goofy in the face just like me and be completely fine because you put the dumbbells down and you picked her up instead. And I know what they're thinking right now. Oh, I know what they're thinking. Women don't like nice guys. Ugh. No, women don't like guys who don't have the capacity to be mean. Mm. Put yourself in their heads for a second. Why the fuck would they be with you if they didn't think that you could really be dangerous if it came down to it? I'm not going to explain that one. You need to think about it. A woman's sex drive in a relationship is based entirely on how you treat her. Are you still flirting with her? Are you still making her feel special? Are you still being kind and responsible and following through on your word? Because I can tell you right now that a woman losing her sex drive in a relationship and losing her respect for you are almost always the same thing. So if she isn't wanting to do it as much, you need to start looking in here and not out there. Zach, Zach, my man, freaking prophet over here. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of this is contributed to the fact that men stop dating their wives. They, they, put in all that effort and then they're like, okay, now, now I just coast from here on out. But no, I don't think that's the key to a happy relationship. So I just thought that was a good take and it's nice to hear it from a man. 
Okay, so this next clip is from a Wisconsin, um, I believe it was a politician, um, or it was, no, a Wisconsin man that spoke at an assembly regarding the 14-week abortion ban, um, and I just want you guys to listen to this flawless forced birther logic. It's flawless, and uh, I just feel like we're in really good hands knowing that these really logical men have uh, control um, over making laws regarding our bodies. So here we go. Did you know that veterinarians are like basically OBGYNs? Just ask Wisconsin Representative Joel Kitchens. Then abortion is not health care. You know, in my veterinary career, I did thousands of, of ultrasounds on animals, you know, uh, determining pregnancy and that kind of thing. So I think I know mammalian fetal development better than probably anyone here. I don't know why we're so worried about these maternity care deserts across Wisconsin. If you're pregnant in Wisconsin, you don't need a specialized doctor. Just call in your local livestock veterinarian to oh check on your mammalian fetus. But that wasn't the only memorable thing said on the assembly floor yesterday. Representative Ron Tussler has some examples of why you're never too old or too young to have a baby. For example, Elizabeth the mother of John the Baptist. Estimates are she was 88 years old (laughs) when she was told that she was going to have John the Baptist. And at 88, her own husband laughed at an angel (laughs) when when he was told and she was told that he was going to have a baby. Second, you've got Mary, the mother of Jesus. (laughs) Estimates, uh, again, are 13 to 14 years old, kind of the other side of the spectrum. And this dude's seriously using the frickin' Bible stories as... (laughs) as evidence look mary was a virgin when she gave birth to jesus therefore like we need to force more people to give birth like what third sarah from the old testament oh abraham's wife she was roughly 90 years old but again 90 years old elderly lady certainly contrary to her personal health what happened to the separation between church and state like does that just not exist anymore apparently apparently it doesn't you having a baby. These examples brought to you by the same book that said Jonah survived being swallowed by a whale and that the inhabitants of Noah's Ark repopulated the earth. <laughs> Safe to say, Representative Sinicki's facial expressions pretty much sum it up. I love how everyone's using that Curb Your Enthusiasm music now. That's really funny. <laughs> I don't know. It's just funny to me. But yeah, we're in good hands, guys. We're in good hands. Just go to the vet next time you, you need prenatal care or something. Okay, just go to a vet. It's all good. Sure, there might not be any OBGYNs left in your state, but there are a lot of vets. So, yeah, try it out. All right. So this next TikTok is from a child marriage survivor. Yes, that is still legal in many states in this country. Yeah. So let's listen to her. We're child marriage survivors. We can't get a divorce until we're 18 or retain a lawyer or access a homeless shelter. Not even a protection order. Child marriage survivors making the global leading cause of death for girls ages 15 to 19 pregnancy and childbirth complications. Child marriage survivors, 60,000 of us were married at an age or a spousal age difference that would have otherwise been considered a sex crime. We're child marriage survivors, making us 50% more likely to drop out of high school and four times less likely to graduate from college. We're child marriage survivors. When we bring up our trauma and our experiences to our family and friends, they're disturbed and shocked and never bring it up again. We're child marriage survivors. We're trafficked to the United States by the hundreds due to federal regulations that have no minimum age for a spousal visa. We're child marriage survivors. 70 to 80% of us get divorced anyway, leaving us and our kids in multi-generational poverty and cost the global economy over $550 billion since 2015. We're child marriage survivors. Until 2018, all 50 states allowed child marriage. Today, 42 states allow child marriage. And 10 of them don't even have a legal minimum, even though the UN said what happened to us is a human rights violation. No legal minimum. No legal minimum. Let just let that sink in. This is in the great U.S. of A. The the West. Oh, the West is falling. Yeah, the West sucks for a long time. It sucked pretty bad. We're child marriage survivors. Ninety percent of us were married to older men. Hi, I'm Brittany B. And I survived a child marriage in the United States. And I am going to end child marriage within my lifetime. Watch me. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. 
I love that. No one knows it better than the survivors themselves. Can you imagine? You're trapped with an old man who's abusing you and you can't even get a divorce until you're 18. Like the logic is, it's not logical. So you can't consent to a divorce, but you can consent to marriage. Oh, God, it's just sickening. But yeah, that's that's what's happening in the great Western country. Woohoo! Yay. And that um, child marriage survivor was Brittany B. Okay, now we have Mary Jane um, about how gossip saves lives, but the patriarchy redefined it to control women. This is fascinating, and it is so true. Gossip saves lives, but it was redefined as a bad thing to control women. I was chatting with a friend about something I had learned from another woman about a guy I knew, and she said, you know, gossip saves lives. It's how we protect ourselves, our sisters, and our children. And I had only recently learned about how the patriarchy redefined gossip. The term dates back to the 12th century when the word God said meant godparent, and then it came to mean someone who was close to you, someone you could tell anything. And it referred to both sexes. But along came gender roles and oppression to redefine and demonize the word. In the Middle Ages, people, largely women, hosted friendship meetings to discuss everything from life partners to political stuff. But the medieval witch hunts targeted female friendships because men believed that women would turn their back on society if they met to share up information. And so men made laws against women who gossiped. A 1547 proclamation forbidding women to meet ordered husbands to keep their wives in their houses. And if a woman didn't comply, she could be accused of being a witch, Hmm. tortured, and killed. Sounds kind of like where we're headed, right? Especially with all this AI technology and the, the dangers of just women, you know, walking around. Women are getting knocked out just standing there on the train platforms. They want to make the world so miserable that we're too afraid to leave. And it's way easier to enforce their, um, you know, their enslavement of women. Talking. And let's be clear. Men gossip. Studies show that men and women gossip equally. But the men believe that when they gossiped, it was for important reasons, like networking. Men hate it when women talk to each other. It's how we share information that could save our lives. It might be important to know that that uncle is creepy. So, chatter away, friends. Ooh, juicy. (laughs) She's eating a sandwich. (laughs) I think that's what she's referring to at the end. Um, Yeah, wow. Wow. So um, keep gossiping, okay? (laughs) Keep spreading the word about creepy guys and creepy people in general. It's how we survive. Okay, this next clip is about how testosterone actually does not cause aggression. Um, I know that's commonly put out there, um, but it's actually not true. So let's listen. This is from Pinpon underscore O one. This is Robert Sapolsky, a neuroendocrinology researcher. So what's the deal with testosterone? Why are males of every species and every culture such a pain in the rear on this planet here? It's because testosterone makes you aggressive. Testosterone doesn't make you aggressive. Here's what it actually does. Take five male rhesus monkeys, put them in a group, let them form a dominance hierarchy. A defeats B three times. B never defeats A. This is the hierarchy. Now take C and inject C with testosterone. Give C like so much testosterone, like every amygdaloid neuron is growing antlers. And that guy just enormous. So now does C get involved in more fights? Absolutely. Is this the pattern that occurs now? Is C suddenly challenging A and B and rising in the heart? Absolutely not. C never does a thing with A and B. What happens instead is C becomes a total nightmare to D and E. Testosterone does not invent aggression. Testosterone exaggerates pre-existing social patterns of aggression. And it turns out it does something even more subtle than that. And this is people beginning to realize what testosterone really does is when your status is being challenged, testosterone makes you do whatever you need to do to maintain status. Now, if you're a baboon and somebody's challenging your status, the way you maintain it is you have a fight with them. It's synonymous. But if you're human, things get more complicated. And for example, you can have an economic game where people get status by making generous offers and give people testosterone and they become more generous in the game 
In other words, if you shot up a whole bunch of Buddhist monks with testosterone, they would run amok doing random acts of kindness all over the place. The trouble isn't that testosterone makes us aggressive. The trouble is that we reward aggression with status so readily. Okay. So, yeah, that... That's very interesting. And it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And that's why I think we see, you know, especially in strict religious hierarchies, we see the person being abusive towards the one that's perceived to be beneath them. You know, you rarely ever see a man going after his priest, but you'll see the man going after the woman or his children because they're beneath him, you know, in the hierarchy. So I just thought that was fascinating. I don't know if you know, monks would go around just doing random acts of kindness. I've heard some messed up things about the monks personally, so I don't know. I don't know, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so this next one, I wrote down men leveraging their children and walking straight into the point. I can't remember exactly what it's about, but let's listen. And this is from the creator Laura Danger on TikTok. Are you ready for the worst take? So let me get this straight, because you didn't want to do chores, you took your children's father away from them. And now that you're single or divorced, you are still doing those chores, right? You're still doing all the same exact amount of work. It's just now your kids don't have their dad. And you probably make it really hard for him to see them. And he's probably had to spend tens of thousands of dollars in court to even just get their opportunity to see them. Like, women, why is this acceptable to you? I'm asking a genuine question to you women. Why is it become normal, accepted, and okay to remove a child from their family so that you get to do the same exact amount of work? This is the height of selfishness. You are taking children's family away from them, taking their father away from them. So you feel better about doing laundry? Stop. Or answer the question so many. Selfish? Selfish? If your partner is doing the household management and the child care management and doing all of the delegating, if they've come to you and they said, I'm unhappy, I'm overwhelmed, I would like more effort from you. I'm tired of making lists and managing appointments and being the knower of all things. I have had enough. They come to you directly. They make a bid. They say, I want to work this out. I want to work on this together. I can't do it. This is unsustainable. Please join me in solving this problem. If you say, no, this is what you signed up for. If your answer is anything other than, yeah, let's come to an agreement that feels good for both of us. You are so fucking entitled. Mm -hmm. You are the selfish one. You make it seem like your mere presence in her life is a prize. Hmm. She would rather do all of it alone. Manage. And okay, real quick. It actually is way less work. Because most men do not clean up after themselves or have like a, a standard of cleanliness that is same to the woman. So it actually becomes less work for women. But, you know, anyways. Everything alone away from you. Then do it with you and constantly be faced with the fact that you are rejecting her. You feel entitled to her time and her energy. You want to benefit from her labor and her care and for her to take care of everything and provide a life for you and for your children. You feel entitled to that. Why is it become normal, accepted, and okay to remove a child from their family so that you get to do the same exact amount of work? If she's going to put in the same mental, emotional, and physical labor with or without you, what makes you feel entitled to her presence? Exactly. What does she owe you if you give her nothing? So let me get this straight. Because you didn't want to do chores, you took your children's father away from them. Your unwillingness to do chores, your unwillingness to participate at home is what ends a marriage. You are so fucking entitled to her time and energy that you would rather lose your family than do a load of fucking laundry. This is the height of selfishness. Are you ready for the worst? T okay, yeah. So, yeah. That's like that that kind of sentiment is what I hear from a large majority of men and it just shows how they truly do believe they are entitled to all of that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I highly doubt the women initiating divorces in those instances are just out of the blue saying, I want a divorce. It's probably been years and years of begging, pleading, pulling their hair out, doing cartwheels and backflips to try and get the guy to understand that they cannot go on like this anymore. It is unsustainable. And you'd think that if these fathers care so much about family and their children, that they would want the mother of their children, the primary attached caregiver, to be happy and to be modeling a healthy relationship for their children so they can go on to have healthy relationships. But no, it, it's pure projection. The way that this man can sit there and say that it's selfish. It's selfish that women want equal partnership and decide that it is no longer sustainable to stay in an unhappy, toxic situation. It's the entitlement is off the charts. And that's why they want to get rid of things like no fault divorce or just divorce in general. You know, like it's it's cr it's crazy to me. Honestly, the whole idea of staying with one person for the rest of your life has just never sat right with me to begin with. I mean, sure, it might happen, but it just feels like most of the time, you know, every 10 years, like people change and grow and sometimes they grow together and sometimes they grow apart. And I don't think it's like necessarily like bad or there was a time in history where every single married couple was happy and in love for the rest of their lives. Like, I don't think we ever had that. You know, I've always liked the idea of hand fasting, that Celtic tradition. It was basically like a year contract trial run kind of thing. I, don't quote me on that. I haven't looked into this for a while, but it was like, OK, we're, we're hand fasting for a year and then we're going to reevaluate. Like that's what happens with corporations, right? They enter agreements and they reevaluate the contract as po as positions change and roles change and circumstances change. And I feel like marriage should be this be the same. I don't think it should just be set in stone. This is the way it's going to be for 50, 60, 70 years or whatever. Um, I feel like things need to be renegotiated. And I think the reason we're seeing so much divorce, well, one of the reasons is because we never had a renegotiation of roles. Women went from being, you know, primarily um, at home. I mean, not even really. If you were like an upper class, the woman might have been predominantly at home. But my family has always worked. So I don't know like where these people come from saying that women used to be in the home all the time. But OK, let's just go with that for a minute. Women were primarily the homemakers. Then we got the opportunity to have our own bank accounts, which was not long ago, by the way, um, you know, own property, make money, actually get paid for our labor. Thank you, feminists, that everyone is constantly dumping on. Um, so we never sat down and renegotiated the roles. We were never like, OK, men. So look, now that we're also working, we cannot be responsible for all of the house care stuff. It's just it's not possible. We can't do it. It's not fair. But like societally, we never reframed our relational contract, men and women. We just kind of like kept going on this hamster wheel. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get to today and women are just utterly exhausted because it does take two incomes really to have a, a good life or something somewhat good life, um, survive. Um, but there was never a renegotiation of roles in the home. It was just women do house care stuff. That's just their domain. They do the bulk of the child rearing and, and now they have to work too. And how dare they not be happy? You know? So I think that's a lot of what happened. We never had a renegotiation of roles. I think that marriages should be renegotiated and new terms should be um, agreed to or disagreed to as time goes on. I just think it's foolish to think that your partner's never going to change or they're never going to grow in a different direction. You know, that's just part of life. And I don't think we should try and stifle that. I think sometimes things just grow apart. And I think it's really unhealthy to artificially force them together when they do not fit together anymore. All right. This next TikTok is from Paige. Um, this is about the unequal distribution of labor. So let's hear what she has to say. Something you will hear often from men who return to work after having a new baby with their partner is that their partner's doing the nights so that they can stay rested and ready for work in the mornings. That she's taking the brunt of the evening wakings and feedings so that way he can get the sleep he needs to be able to show up to work and do a good job. But we forget that in this scenario, 
mom also needs to wake up and do a good job the next day. And for me, this is really where that shift of the mental load and the domestic labor really leans towards mom. It's in those very first days of parenting because when dad goes back to work, because most men don't take or have paternity leave, mom is overburdened with the amount of work. Not only is she doing the domestic labor because she's home, she's also up all night. And so she is not refreshed or rested to do a good job taking care of her child because they placed the priority and value on the paid work. And we all know that money makes this world go around. We need money to survive. But that is not more valuable than what mom is doing at home. And what often happens is this woman then returns to work. Let's say she returns to work eight weeks later, 12 weeks later, hopefully six months later, if she's in a good place with good maternity leave, she returns to work and that baby's still not sleeping through the night. Does dad jump back in the ring with her or does he defer to her and say, oh honey, but you've been doing it and he, he only wants you in the middle of the night and you do it better and I don't even hear him. So, you know, you hear the baby. So it's obvious that you get up with the baby. Is that what happens or does dad jump back in? Oftentimes, mom remains responsible for those things. And this is where the uneven division of labor starts with parenting. And that is why in my feminist utopia, we would have state-sponsored postpartum doulas and spa retreats. <laughs> okay, this next clip is from Margo. Um, she says here, patriarchy secures men the power to avoid making choices and then obscures its operation by creating a narrative wherein freedom is grounded in choice. Freedom is not the same thing as power and under patriarchy, power is grounded in dominance, not choice. So let's listen to what she has to say a video where the first sentence the creator says is i think there are a lot of guys who are married who shouldn't be and she goes on to tell a story about how she was at a sporting event and you know kind of was overhearing a conversation between a bunch of bros uh one of whom was married and he was wearing a wedding ring and the married one was saying something like man i'm so jealous of you like you're still single i wish i was still single because like i would totally just want to bag a different chick like every month and the creator talks about how sad that made her feel like as a woman she would never want to be married to somebody who was speaking like that about her to his friends and then at the end uh, of the video the creator says like you know you don't have to get married right like you also can get divorced like well, they want they you don't want have both. to be in this situation at all like it's just very very weird, weird behavior and here's the thing it's not weird this is exactly how patriarchy is designed to work this is exactly how patriarchy is designed to work. And I think we miss that a lot when we have this conversation, when we talk about, like, you you can be with someone you actually like. You don't have to get married. And when we focus on, like, how patriarchy harms men also, we, we miss this really, really important point. Patriarchy is about him being able to have a wife and exhibit that behavior. He is having the best of both worlds by having a wife and denigrating her to his male friends. He is having the best of both worlds. By and that is honestly, unfortunately, how a lot of men bond. They bond through talking negatively about women and their wives. Like that is their male bonding tool. And it's just really pathetic. Having a wife and talking about other women in a way that sexualizes and makes them objects. Patriarchy is designed to work such that he does not choose that the best thing he has is a wife who is below him, who is denigrated, and the freedom to impress his bros, to have camaraderie with his bros by talking about how great he would fuck all the other women if he could. Patriarchy is designed to work that way. The point is he doesn't have to make a choice. That's how patriarchy works. Women have to make hard choices. Men never do. Men never do. They get to have all of it and complain. And now they're mad that women, some women, are starting to glom on to the whole problem and are forcing them to choose. They're having a temper tantrum because they're being forced to choose to make decisions. Patriarchy is about men not having to make hard choices. It's about them, in fact, not having to make any choices at all, never having to take responsibility for themselves. Just interesting take. Um, it's really, really sad because these men know that they don't have to get married, right? But they do it because they benefit from it. <laughs> 
<laughs> they live longer. You know, they've got a woman doing all kinds of free labor for, for them. So they want their cake and they want to eat it, too. And so many of them do. Like most of the men on dating apps are just straight up married and like not even trying to hide it. So it's just a very depressing state of affairs. All right. This next clip is about a dynamic that happens all too commonly. It's basically in abusive relationships when the abusive partner will say that all of the problems are the victim's fault. And um, they'll tell them, like, you need to get help. You need therapy. You need medication, something like that. And um, this is also based off of Lundy Bancroft's book, Why Does He Do That? I recommend every single woman and girl ever read that book. And if we ever do make a discord. I want to have like a book club where we can all read a book at the same time and discuss it. But that is required reading and you can find free PDFs online. But this is from um, Anitza and she's responding to a comment. Someone said, how did you do it? I need advice. Did your ex make it difficult to leave? I'm scared to tell my husband I want out. Let's listen to her. Honestly, I started going to therapy. He was tired of how horrible my sex drive had declined after all the children and everything was my fault and I was just the worst person, wife, mother, everything in the whole entire world. So I made an appointment at the doctor thinking I had something wrong with like my hormone levels or something like obviously I'm going to keep pushing through. This is my life. And I was just kind of a shell of a human and a robot of version of myself. I went to the doctor and said, Hey, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm in my like later thirties. Like, could you test me? Is there something wrong? And like, I was just kind of, you know, very dead inside. And the doctor, you know, way to go to her. She picked up immediately what was going on. She like asked a little bit more about my personal life. And then she said, I'm not testing anything. I want you to feel better first. And she prescribed me an antidepressant. I got in trouble for that. He is the one that drove me to the appointment and then picked me up. And he was so excited to hear what was this magic fix. And when I told him that they prescribed me an SSRI, he lost his shit. And I was like, okay, yeah, maybe the problem is me. I'll go to therapy. Maybe it's me. So I kept, but I knew, I knew what the fucking problem was. Uh, I went to therapy and I started telling the therapist all the stories, like all the arguments we had been having. And, you know, if anything, I was twisting the story to lean more to him. Like I was definitely giving him all the benefit of the doubt and definitely being like brutally honest with what I was doing. And then maybe, you know, definitely giving him the benefit of the doubt whenever I told her the story. And my therapist was like, so I'm concerned for you. It sounds like the person you're with has some sort of a personality disorder. I can't diagnose them. I've never met them. But just from your stories, I would assume there's definitely something wrong. And she just started to make a whole thing, bunch of things pieced together. And from going through the motions of putting myself first and making sure that I was taking care of myself, I, once I could see him for what it was and under, I also started reading the book, Why Does He Do That? by Lundy Bancroft. There's free, uh, I'm going to put the title of that book in the comments. So therapy in that book and just like starting to learn made it impossible to stay. It wasn't even a question. It wasn't even like, oh, oh, he's going to make it hard to leave. That motherfucker tried to make it hard to leave. I've been gone for five years now. He's still trying to make it hard to leave. I'm still happy. I still would make that. If anything, I just regret I didn't leave sooner. So I'm sending you all my love and encouragement. That's a lot of what happens. Abusers will try and paint the victim as the sole reason of any kind of relational issues that are going on and so that victim will then take that on and believe it and then go find help like well geez if i'm such a horrible terrible person i want to change unlike the person with the most likely personality disorder who can never even admit to being wrong or that they need to work on anything that they need to change um and then they end up learning from the therapist that they're actually being abused emotionally (laughs) so Touche abusers, your little blame game stuff isn't working that well anymore because now they're just going to find out that they're not the problem, that they don't need to be on all these medications and this and that. Um, You know, like it's sad. It's it's really, really sad. But um, I'm just glad more people are becoming knowledgeable about the red flags and learning to to, you know, to, to leave something if it's not healthy. 
This next clip, uh, kind of staying on the same topic here, is about covert abuse because covert abuse is very hard to pinpoint. Obviously, it's covert, it's hidden, um, but its effects are just as bad as overt abuse. So this woman is Eleni DV Educator, um, or Education, rather, on TikTok. She has a book as well. I forget what it's called. Um, She's responding to a comment that says, my husband had some red flags I thought were small because he was so kind and generous and helped strangers. It was all an act to feel good about himself, not actually to be kind or good. And this is what a lot of um, covert abusers will do. They'll they'll basically be like the pillar of society, the hero. So when women try and tell their story about that man abusing them, no one will even believe them because they say, well, he's he's a pillar of the community. He's a hero. You know, he's the pastor or he's the fireman that saved the cat from the tree. And so these women aren't believed. I didn't think that video was going to blow up, but the comments break my heart. And no, like that behavior is not normal. But I did want to highlight this comment. He was so kind and generous and helped strangers. It was all an act to feel good about himself, not to actually be kind or good. So Dr. David Hawkins actually speaks about this type of abuser, a covert abuser. And I absolutely love his work. I highly recommend his book, When Loving Him is Hurting You. So he's nice until he's not. Many individuals who engage in covert emotional abuse initially appear pleasant, friendly, and cooperative. They may be charismatic and well-respected in their communities, often holding positions of power and influence. However, behind closed doors, they reveal a darker side akin to the infamous Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The hidden persona, Mr. Hyde, represents their shadow side, a part that they don't want anyone else to see. They do go out, they help strangers, they make themselves appear as if they're good people. The issue is with these type of abusers is that they create a lot of cognitive dissonance for their victims. Because you're like, well, they're so great to everyone else but me, so that I must be the problem. But in actuality, what's really happening is that they're actually just very good at manipulating other people's perceptions. These abusers are all about their image, how they appear to other people. And when they help others, it's not about an actual desire to help them for the sake of helping them. It's about how they appear. Does that action make me seem like a good person? But as soon as they don't have an audience, like when they're behind closed doors or with you one-on-one, they show their true colors. They're often cruel and abusive personalities. And then when a victim comes forward that this person is an abuser, they're less likely to be believed because that person seems like such a good person. It's just... Uh, Yeah, that was pretty much the end of it. Um, Yeah, this reminds me, I guess the term could, uh, the term that's used is a communal narcissist, one that is like, oh, the volunteer, the martyr, the hero or heroine, you know, just pillar of the community. So yeah, Um, be careful out there. Covert abuse is just as insidious and it's much harder to pinpoint. All right, we're going to play one more clip and then we will close out for the episode. Okay, so we're going to end this on a light note. (laughs) We're going to get to laugh a little bit. Um, This is from the speech prof. Um, He's commenting on a man's advice about how to deal with men. Um, So let's listen. How to express negative emotions to men. I need to make this concept very clear for you all. I got tagged in this by a few people. And this is a great example of a video that I was certain was parody. It's not. First, a man has to solicit from you. This sentence didn't stick in my head until like the third time watching this video. But it's important, right? Because what he's saying here is that even in a situation where your boyfriend or your husband did something clearly wrong to you that upset you, you can't tell them that straight away. You have to make them feel like it was their idea. And what if the man never even brings it up? What are you just supposed to like never say anything (laughs) like you could be clearly upset and if he doesn't ask you what's wrong like you just never bring it up it has to be him soliciting that's crazy to solve this problem that they created differential reinforcement you do positive reinforcement for the behaviors that are good in him you cheerlead and show happiness gush when he's bad you negative punishment you remove your attention you don't yap and criticize him or tell him i'll stop acting like this when you act good you withdraw i don't know if any of you have ever done 
like <laughs> puppy training. This is puppy training for your dogs. But this this is what they teach you. This is Pavlovian as well for your dogs and men act he wants to come to make you feel better so he starts trying to problem solve so when he comes to you he says what's going on you don't immediately answer the question of course not why why be honest and direct go on you first say no i've just been feeling a little you know off but how are you you ask if he really cares he asks again right he pursues so then you know it's real then you do 20 percent specific on the negative emotion the emotional state with i statements this sounds exhausting yeah and not in a like relationships take hard work kind of way but in a you have to make him your special boy Mm -hmm. kind of way you have to be his mommy kind of way then you do 80 percent on the positive general emotion so you're not telling him what to do of course not why would anybody want specific direct communication about what they did to hurt their partner in some way <laughs> right Th- this is much more effective so it gives him a general goal to work to wear without instructing him just like in the bedroom you do the same thing how am i the one uh, between the two of us, how am I the one that gets men in my comment sections angry at me and saying that I hate men for saying that we're capable of doing better? Mm-hmm. How, how does how does that compute in your head? Where this guy who is literally being so derogatory to what men are capable of, Right to, to to the fact that we're not just primal animals or children. Yet his comments are full of men that are like, "Yes, this is how it's done. Make it make sense." How to? Why would you? That sounds so exhausting, so draining. No, thank you. <laughs> that literally sounds like torture. You got to do it. You got to basically manipulate. It's like manipulation or it's basically like behavioral modification on your partner when you shouldn't have to do that. It should be an equal partnership. It shouldn't be one person like using behavioral interventions on their freaking partner. Oh, but yeah, that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Go train those puppies.